and then now we move on to the college lecture it will be delivered by uh, dr taranga samarasekara uh, and the topic will be beyond the blue pill managing male sexual dysfunction dr samarasekara is a consultant endocrinologist at the teaching hospital kalutara over to you dr samarasekara uh, to begin your presentation thank you very much so thank you very much uh, ccp for inviting me to do the college lecture today Today, I'm going to discuss a topic very close to our hearts as we get older. It's managing male sexual dysfunction beyond the blue pill. The blue pill here is a metaphor. It's not actually the silver pill tablet that is universally blue in color. And you will uh, get what I'm going to tell you once we finish the lecture. So outline for the topic today or what is male sexual dysfunction then we'll discuss few things on physiology of penile erection then uh, how to evaluate sexual dysfunction in a male and management of erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation which are the two most common uh, problems that we encounter and the summary what is sexual dysfunction it's a sexual problem associated with personal distress it can happen at the onset of sexual life or it can acquire later in life after a period of normal function. It could be primary or secondary, or it could be generalized or situational. And when it comes to males, sexual dysfunction uh, can be divided in three major categories. It could be reduced libido, it could be erectile dysfunction, or it could be one of the ejaculatory disorders. Premature ejaculation is the commonest, uh, and we sometimes encounter patients with delayed ejaculation or retrograde ejaculation, and sometimes with uh, anorgasmia, they are unable to ejaculate. And today, for the discussion, we'll concentrate mainly on a reduced libido, erectile dysfunction, and the premature ejaculation. So, uh, let me start with the question. So, what do you think? So the prevalence of erectile dysfunction in older males, when I say older, it's the age 40 to 70 group. And it's, you will be surprised to see that it's much more common than we think, about 50%. So think of the patients you saw during the last week in your busy medical clinic and think about all the, the gentlemen that you saw. And one in two will have erectile dysfunction or uh, other sexual uh, dysfunctions uh, at any period of time in their life. So if we are bothered to you know, ask patients, they will tell us. The problem is the busy clinic setup we have difficult to have a, you know, uh, a good conversation with the patient due to the time and space problems. And this is the study that I got my data from. It's uh, done in USA and uh, overall prevalence was 52%. And you can also appreciate in this graph that as they get older, the sexual problems becoming more prevalent. And there's an age associated decline in the frequency of sexual intercourse and there's reduced erection frequency and reduced sexual desire and there's reduced satisfaction with sex and uh, orgasm. If you are a movie fan, you will appreciate the joke that in the shown in the cartoon it's from the Star Wars that with aging, the force is not with you. So who sees patients with sexual dysfunction? Uh, there are many of our colleagues uh, see patients with sexual dysfunction, mainly patients can come to a general practitioner or the specialist in sexual medicine. In our setup, it's mainly the consultants who are doing uh, sexual transit diseases and urologists and clinical medical colleagues and endocrinology. And sometimes they come to psychiatry and neurology. And sometimes patients are picked up at the gynecology clinic where, the, where they come to seek treatment for uh, subfertility. So it's a multidisciplinary team approach. We all share a piece of this cake. Let me now go through uh, briefly on physiology of penile erection. So erection needs a teamwork. Okay, erection is mainly a vascular phenomenon, but you need to have a good neurological, psychological, and hormonal uh, systems in order to have a erect penis. So what are the types of erections? There are three main groups. Uh, psychogenic erections are uh, started with the onset of, you know, Thinking about erotic uh, thoughts or erotic stimuli it could be visual or can occur in your mind. Then there are nocturnal non-sexual erections. Uh, it can happen during the REM sleep. Then there are reflex erections, which is uh, caused by you know, touching of the genitalia uh, or tactile stimulation. 
So how does an erection occur? It all happened in the brain. Yeah, there, there is a visual or olfactory, imaginative or tactile stimulation which lead to secretion of neurotransmitters, which stimulates the parasympathetic system. Sympathetic system inhibits erection. Parasympathetic system uh, stimulates the erection. The, there is neuronal input on the pelvic plexus, so you need to have an intact pelvic plexus to get an erection, and uh, they converge on the penis to give the erection. Now we look at the penis. So in the non-erect penis, uh, the smooth muscle sign, the contracted state, and sinusoidal cavities are empty. Once there is a neurological stimulation, there is nitric oxide release from the endothelial cells, which lead to uh, you know filling of the sinusoidal cavities with blood, blood and the penis become engorged and become erect. At the molecular level, uh, this nitric oxide uh, is converted to cyclic GMP uh, by guanylate cyclase, uh, which leads to the smooth muscle relaxation. And phosphodiesterase 5 will convert cyclic GMP to GMP. And whatever goes up should come down. So erections, uh, they don't last for forever. Erection should come down naturally. So, tetamescence or loss of erection occurs when the nitric oxide induced vasodilation disappears because of the metabolism of cyclic GMP. This is mediated by the intracavernosal type 1 cyclic GMP, which is shown in blue color. And that is where our sildenafil or tadalafil drug act. It will inhibit the PDE5 and uh, which will inhibit breakdown of cyclic GMP. So, it will increase the cyclic GMP concentration and smooth muscles will uh, kept on a relaxed position and you have a sustained erection. So what is the relationship between testosterone and male sexual activity? We all know testosterone plays an integral role in normal male sexual function and normal testosterone levels are important for libido. And it is necessary for maintenance of intraphenyl nitric oxide synthase and testosterone deficiency results in erectile dysfunction and the function returns when testosterone levels are normalized. We see this in patients with uh, primary hypomagnetism or secondary hypomagnetism after pituitary disorders. Once we start replacing them with testosterone, their sexual functions become normal. Next, we'll move on to how to evaluate male sexual dysfunction. It is the basics. You do a good history and uh, do a uh, focused physical examination and do some tests depending on your findings. So routine history and there should be a detailed sexual history. Then you proceed with physical examination. The history and physical examination alone will have a 95% sensitivity in detecting erectile dysfunction. You don't need any tests, but the problem is specificity, like determining the cause that might need some further digging or do some testing. You can do additional diagnostic tests to look for etiology like nocturnal fetal tamasans, NPT testing, or like hormones, uh, thyroid, testosterone, and the prolactin. What are the aims of clinical evaluation? First, we'll assess the libido, then evaluate the erectile function, then differentiate erectile dysfunction from premature ejaculation. This is very important, very important, uh, because sometimes patients say they can't perform, and we think, okay, this is erectile dysfunction, but when you have a discussion with them, it's actually, they can get the erection, but they ejaculate quickly. Uh, they, sometimes at the, you know, penetration itself, uh, they get uh, ejaculated. So uh, these kind of patients need different kind of treatment. They may not benefit from sildenafil as we think. And uh, determine the rapidity of onset of erectile dysfunction. This is again important for the differential diagnosis. Then assess the risk factors and causes for erectile dysfunction. Again, very important and mostly overlooked one. Then you plan the uh, management. In the sexual history, you look at the sexual desire or libido. Uh, for the research purposes, of course, you can use there are, you know, various uh, indexes for screening tools that you can use, which is find in Google. However, for the busy clinic setup, you can just ask directly uh, and uh, you know get a subjective assessment of it. Uh, again, for the erectile dysfunction, you can use the same question as and look for always look for other sexual problems like premature ejaculation or peyronie's disease and uh, in the history itself try to identify common causes of erectile dysfunction and reversible risk factors for erectile dysfunction like uh, relationship issues 
then uh, get a detailed psychosocial history. Rapidity of onset is quite important because sometimes patients say, I have no sexual problems until one night where I could not perform. We usually see this in young patients when they you know, get married and go to honeymoon, suddenly they find it difficult because they had been masturbating without any problem, but suddenly when they try to do the real act, the, they can't you know get it directed so these kind of patients have good prognosis it's mainly due to performance anxiety and psychogenic factors just uh, you know uh, refer to psychiatrists and i have a chat with them and reassurance will help them and uh, sometimes especially you know people who are married for a long time they can have issues with current sexual partner so they say i can't you know have sex with my wife but when further questioning they might have another one or two partners where they have no problems having uh, sex and there could be some other emotional problems especially during this time of you know our, our country we have a lot of financial uh, issues and you know social issues happening and people uh, are losing their jobs and their income so a lot of men are under stress so i usually get a lot of patients to this you know stress problem and they have now problems with having sex and sometimes uh, patients come say they say okay i i was having normal sexual function then suddenly you know there were one or two incidences where i could not perform but now recently i can't perform at all so these kind of patients you have to be mindful because they may have an underlying uh, cause like uh, you know hypogonadism or systemic illness that is lurking under their body which may lead to this kind of presentation and uh, always ask for erectile reserve. We, uh, it's just one question. Do you get morning erections? So spontaneous erections are important clue to a psychological cause and makes a vascular neurological cause unlikely because if the patient having a spontaneous erection means that they have intact pelvic plexus and intact hormonal milieu. Uh, and uh, if you are, want to really do an you know, assessment using NPG testing, uh, but you can appreciate that the, there are spontaneous erections during REM sleep or often waking up with an erection that is called morning glory, right? Uh, and in the sexual history, again, uh, uh, need to ask this question. Uh, okay, you get the erection, but when you try to insert or upon insertion, suddenly uh, you can't sustain the erection. This could be due to anxiety or uh, no, performance anxiety or could be due to a vascular problem like a venous leak from the subclavicular veins um, and this will lead to a negative feedback loop and the patient won't be get any erection if this happens frequently because it will uh, cause stress and uh, it will lead to adrenergic hormone release as i mentioned earlier sympathetic activation will kill the erection and uh, always uh, try to you know get a history of interpersonal conflict because although initially there may not be a you know relationship issues but when the patients have sexual dysfunction it could you know cause sexual uh, you know relationship problems so it's one of the things we need to address and if possible always try to get a, a partner review get the spouse and ask whether they uh, what they think uh, or other what their concerns are and in the physical examination, uh, get the weight, blood pressure, and visual fit the basics and uh, check the pulses to look for any vasculopathy and look at the penis and the testes. Uh, uh, in peyronie's disease, you will see the penile flux and look for like uh, evidence of hypogradism, like uh, loss of male, male hair pair patterns, then uh, gynecomastia and small testes. And you can do the cremestrate reflex to uh, look at whether the reflex arcs is intact. And the lab test, of course, uh, can do the basics like fasting blood sugar, hb one to take diabetes, which is one of the commonest causes of erectile dysfunction in male. And you can do the cholesterol, uh, liver function and the kidney functions, the full blood count and the ECG. Hormones, of course, uh, where indicated, you can do a serum total testosterone, thyroid and prolactin. And if you need objective assessment, you can do a nocturnal penile tamosense, especially if you are, the patient is not responding to your first line treatment, and it can do a penile ultrasound and a Doppler as well. So now we look at uh, each uh, category of sexual dysfunction. Do you sleep 
it's uh, not as common as erectile dysfunction, but, but however, it's not that rare also. The prevalence is around like five to 10% in men. And of course, the libido uh, in, uh, reduces with age and it frequency accompanies other types of sexual dysfunction. And this is quite important. Loss of libido could be secondary consequence of erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation. Especially I see a lot of patients with premature ejaculation, they don't want to do anything related to sex, then they don't have the sex drive anymore. But once you, you know, it takes a lot of effort to bring them out of that mindset, negative mindset, and uh, treat them with medications, uh, treat the underlying cause, uh, you know, uh, causes, and send them for cognitive behavioral therapy to get them out of that uh, you know, negative state of mind. And what are the causes of reduced libido? Relationship issues are the most common. Then stress, especially as I mentioned earlier, in current state of Sri Lanka, then drugs. All this, all this go to the drug list. There are a lot of drugs causing reduced libido, and especially the older males, they have hypertension. There are a lot of medications, so always go through the drug list. And testosterone deficiency is also common, can occur towards, you know, as they, we get older and depression, and especially leukosystemic illnesses, undiagnosed diabetes, undiagnosed dyslipidemia, uh, like that, you need to keep an open mind. And erectile dysfunction, of course, has a list of its own. This is not a complete list, as you can see, uh, it can, uh, you know, could categorize these causes into different uh, groups like vascular neurologic, local phenyl factors, hormonal factors, drug induced, and psychogenic. What we commonly see are psychogenic and drug induced ones, and but always remember uh, vascular and neurologic causes, especially patients with long term chronic illnesses. Premature ejaculation is quite interesting. Uh, how do you define ejaculation? Normal ejaculation time for a normal male is actually shorter than you think. It's uh, like uh, five, three to five minutes. So, ejaculatory latency of approximately one minute or less is considered premature. So there is and this is there is consistent inability to delay or control ejaculation, and there is marks distress about the condition. So you need all three components to categorize patient uh, as having uh, as premature ejaculation. So there is ejaculatory latency of less than one minute, consistent inability to or delayed control ejaculation and marks distress about the condition. And there are subtypes of premature ejaculation. There is lifelong versus acquired. There is global versus situational. And there is co-occurrence of other sexual problems like erectile dysfunction and loss of libido. And acquired premature ejaculation is more likely to be associated with a psychological cause compared to lifelong premature ejaculation which is likely to be associated with genetic factors. What do you think is a norm? Norm is actually uh, it's due to natural selection because our ancestors, uh, when they have sex, uh, the males who could finish the job quickly and get out of the situation had the more chances of survival compared to you know, males who took a long time to ejaculate. So naturally, they, uh, there's a bias towards the a gene which is having reduced uh, time for ejaculation. So uh, uh, there are a group of people, they have lifelong premature ejaculation. And of course, management depends on etiology, but the main stages of therapy include SSRIs, they uh, work, and there are lo local anesthetics and uh, psychotherapy. Uh, all are important because this is quite a challenging uh, you know, condition to treat compared to erectile dysfunction. So what are the helpful measures in sexual dysfunction? This slide is quite important because as I mentioned earlier, the topic is beyond blue pill. We can just write a tablet for uh, like a prescription for sildenafil and forget about it. But these things are quite important because the patient will you know, eventually, eventually uh, run into problems uh, if we don't correct the other factors. So cognitive behavioral therapy is quite important. So these patients, they are either depressed, they have negative feedback uh, loop happening on, in their head, they have lost confidence. So they need uh, good psychological support. And uh, Kegel exercises, the pelvic floor exercises are quite important to have a good direction and control the ejaculation. Weightlifting has been shown to improve sexual function in male. They will boost their mood they will increase their testosterone levels naturally and 
uh, I advise all the males to do a resistant training as they become older. Couples counseling is quite important because a lot of these patients have relationship issues, either primary or as a secondary to their sexual problems. Then lifestyle modifications are quite overlooked and we need to really, really ask and advise them to stop smoking because cessation of smoking may be the one thing that you know helps in our patient to reduce cardiovascular mortality as well as erectile dysfunction. Sometimes when they have sexual dysfunction, it's just a tip of the iceberg. They have a lot of other problems like morbid obesity, lung problems, then ischemic heart disease. So uh, they may come to you with erectile dysfunction, but when you take a thorough history and do the blood test only, you realize the depth of the problem and they need to lose weight. And if they are taking a lot of alcohol, they need to cut down alcohol. And uh, please take a note of these uh, helpful measures. And next time when you see a patient with erectile dysfunction or sexual dysfunction, try to apply uh, these for their management. And management of erectile dysfunction, uh, it's quite straightforward. You try to identify the etiology. Then uh, identify the cardiovascular risk factors like smoking, obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, and try to do the lifestyle measures and pharmacotherapy. And initiate medical therapy. Uh, there's shared decision making because uh, the, these drugs are not without side effects. So, we need to discuss with the patient. Uh, these are quite safe, but there are side effects. But patients usually get a uh, prescription for sildenafil or tadalafil. Uh, good thing about uh, phosphodiesterase says five inhibitors are they have a good efficacy, they are easy to use, and they have a compared to a lot of other medications that we use in our clinics, favorable side effect profile. There are uh, several drugs in that group, but what is available in Sri Lanka are sildenafil and the tadalafil. A few more details on uh, PD five inhibitors they increase both the number and duration of erections in men. This is quite important, especially patients with premature ejaculation. They may uh, you know, increase the chances of having a second go if they prematurely ejaculate. And they will not work without sufficient environmental and psychological cues. That is quite important. Just taking the tablet won't get, be helpful. Patients should have a good supportive environment and psychological cues that will result in sufficient sexual arousal and stimulation to do the you know initiate the physiological changes in the penis and remember especially when patients are this is it's contraindicated in men taking nitrates and always use cautiously in men receiving an alpha blocker sildenafil is common that we use it works there are a lot of evidence that it works and in it should be taken orally on empty stomach preferably one hour prior to planned sexual encounter uh, the initial dose is 50 milligrams. Uh, if there are side effects, it can reduce the dose to 25 and it can be increased to 100 milligrams if uh, the effect is less. The duration of action is approximately four hours. Then we have tadalafil, which is a bit expensive than the sildenafil. It's effective as sildenafil, but however, it has a longer duration of action. It can last like one day. The and starting dose is 10 milligrams if you are using as a you know, uh, as needed tablet. But if you are using it daily, you can reduce to five milligrams per day. And you can increase the dose to 20 milligrams, so it's basis if necessary. So if we compare the two tablets, sildenafil or tadalafil, sildenafil is cheaper, safer, but there's a problem with uh, drug absorption uh, with high fat milks and alcohol. Tadalafil has a longer duration of activity, it is expensive, but with daily dosing is better. Uh, it get better results and food does not interfere with the absorption. It's very important to be aware of the side effects and always tell the patient they have vasodilatory properties. So patients get complaints of you know flushing in their ears, they get headaches, severe headaches, and they get dyspepsia, like burning kind of feeling in their uh, stomach, and there could be nasal congestion, like uh, developed in cata. However, these uh, side effects are short lasting. They last like one or two hours. And if they take a panadol and an antihistamine or a proton pump inhibitor, uh, most of these side effects will uh, won't happen. Sometimes they have rarely they have this blue vision kind of visual disturbance. And there are a lot of drug interactions, so be mindful of that also when you're using sildenafil or tadalafil in your patient. And sometimes, Usually they work, but 
they don't work, always ask the patient how it is used. Sometimes they take it in the morning, uh, the sildenafil, and they go to you know have sex at night. So, uh, so it's not the proper way to take it. So look at the dose technique and look at the intercurrent medications and look for the factors. If there's a relationship issues, that will not act because you know drug needs a good environment and uh, psychological input to act. And uh, this is the time, uh, if it is not working, this is the time you, you look for, you know, seek your help from the specialist colleagues like uh, urologist or the uh, specialist in sexual medicine. And if uh, for like vacuum erection devices, penile injections with vasodilating agents, and penile prosthetics, uh, like that. Low intensity shock wave therapy is another method method that is used in Sri Lanka. This delivers uh, several thousand low intensity shocks to the penis and it induces angiogenesis. And it has you know, conflicting evidence in clinical trials whether it's useful or not, but it's something that we use in our setup. So this is the outline for the management of erectile dysfunction. At, uh, you know, if you look at the physiology, there are different medications or different interventions that you can use to target depending on patient's requirement. Then we'll move to premature ejaculation uh, and SSRIs are the first right treatment. Uh, there are different SSRIs that you can choose from. Always remember, start with a lower dose and titrate up as needed. So you can use on-demand, tapoxetine and paroxetine, both are available in Sri Lanka. And there are local things like delayed spray or local anesthetic agents. So you can con use condoms uh, you know, containing benzocaine, which will uh, reduce the sensation of the penis, glass penis, and uh, increase the uh, timing of uh, the sex. However, it will reduce the you know, pleasurable feeling for the male partner. Little bit of dapoxetine and paroxetine. Dapoxetine, uh, we have a strength 30 milligrams and can go up to 60 milligrams. It's taken on demand one to three hours before it goes. Paroxetis uh, can be used uh, regularly as a daily dose, or it can be taken a daily uh, on demand, uh, one to three hours before it goes. Both drug, drugs have side effects, of course. They can cause, you know, difficult, you know, some kind of headache, session cell, they feel, don't feel normal. They have discomfort when they take these tablets, but some people, they can tolerate the tablet well. So, would you take the blue pill or the red pill? Again, this is from the movie Matrix. This is a metaphor. So uh, in our busy clinics, when the patients say they have problems with sex, we just tend to write the blue pill, the children pill, and uh, send them home. However, I want uh, after this today's discussion, I want you to open your eyes to the you know the gravity of the problem. One, it's quite common. So, and there are a lot of underlying factors, the relationship issues, the, the patient has a lot of risk factors in their own body. So you need to think uh, laterally and uh, look at the patient as a whole and the, uh, you know, look at the spouse. Then uh, think about the proper management. All this, uh, try to correct the risk factors, try to identify the cause and rather than giving the sildenafil, uh, try to manage the patient as a whole. So in summary, male sexual dysfunction is a common problem. And there are three types, reduced libido, erectile dysfunction, and premature ejaculation. Usually clinical evaluation will identify the problem. And always remember non-medical measures like losing weight, doing weight training, and stopping smoking. This will definitely help. And always remember relationship issues. Talk to your patient, talk to your patient's spouse and uh, refer them for psychotherapy or counseling when they have these uh, kind of problems. And always try medication like sildenafil, tadalafil, or tapoxetine or paroxetine because they work. They have side effects, but they do work. But if they don't work, refer promptly to, to uh, a colleague who are specializing in sexual problems to manage because this has a big impact on patient's quality of life. So thank you. And we can have questions. Thank you, Taranga. Yes. Hello. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you, Taranga. You. It, uh, you you like covered the, all the aspects of erectile dysfunction, but uh, but we see today is unfortunately we don't have much other than sildenafil and tadalafil. 
like there are people who will not uh, respond to these two drugs due to various exactly. reasons some some the testosterone level is pretty normal so that normal means they have a tremendous uh, libido but uh, it doesn't work so what kind of options have you been have you been given those patients who fail to respond to pd5 inhibitors yeah so in this kind of patient i always sit down and have a chat I spend like 10 15 minutes uh, so try to get an uh, understanding of how, uh, why the drug is not working uh, right. no if you look uh, if you like take off the you know relationship issues the stress and all those factors uh, yeah. Then you need to go through the drug history and see whether are there any interfering medications. Sometimes I have found patients who are on spinolactone, <laughs> which is missed by me, yeah. of course. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so you need to look at the drugs. Then there could be vascular problems. This is where we are a yeah. bit helpless because patients with atherosclerotic vascular disease, they can have problems in the vasculature. Mm -hmm. So these kind of patients, of course, I refer to my urologically. So he can try with the mm -hmm. injections. Yeah, and I had one patient who had a prosthetic implant, so which is of course uh, you know irreversible surgery. And in yeah. other countries, of course, they have these uh, you know uh, vacuum devices, but I have not seen yeah. in Sri Lanka. And they have these uh, implantable devices uh, that could sustain the action. So those are the things that we could help. But is there yeah. little we can do at our you know medical general medical clinic setup if the drugs don't work? But of course, you can go through the drug history. And you can look at the relationship factors and see whether any 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 you know any things that we can correct. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Charmin, for that question. Uh, this is Arusha. Are, are there any other questions yeah. from the audience? <clears throat> One key thing I want to highlight is that uh, there is a, uh, you know premature ejaculation is also quite common. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, when we uh, ask the patient only, they will tell, okay, it's not actual ejection, I get the erection, but when I try to insert, I, you know, jump the gun. So, in that case, uh, rather than trying, uh, you know, you can, of course, try sildenafil, but can add peroxidine or no depoxidine, which is now available. Yeah. Right. In the absence of any further questions, it is, it is my great pleasure to thank Dr. Taranga. Uh, for this excellent presentation uh, and it's a wide far-reaching presentation i hope uh, and you know taranga uh, this will be people will look at this on the ccp youtube channel people will look at the facebook and uh, uh, there'll be if you look at the number of views you will notice that the number of views keep growing every week so this That's will good. be a talk that will that will last for some time and i'm sure many people will benefit so uh, i thank you profoundly for this uh, nalina is it possible for us to award the certificate uh, of appreciation from the ccp is that available yes yes thank you very much so thank you in the audience thank you chaminda for joining us as well and thank you taranga uh, Nalina, thank you very much. So let's meet at another Young Physicians Forum and a college lecture next year, of course, under the presidency of Dr. Dunyinda Dasa in 2023. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.